Have you ever thought about roofing? I have, and that's why I'm up on my shed roof here uh, with a whole bunch of straw. If you are in a building or have ever been in a building or uh, enjoy having a building or a roof over your head, roofing is something that should matter to you. So let's talk a little bit about roofing today and specifically thatching and why it might be a sustainable, local, eco-friendly alternative to basically everything else. This is the Low Tech Podcast. Hello and welcome, I'm Scott Johnson from the Low Technology Institute, your host for podcast number 58 on November 4th, 2022, coming to you out of the Low Tech Institute's gardens in Cooksville, Wisconsin. Thanks for joining us. Today we're talking thatch. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter, our handle is at low underscore techno, like us on Facebook, find us on Instagram, subscribe to us on YouTube, and check out our website, lowtechinstitute.org. There you can find both of our podcasts, as well as information about joining and supporting the Institute and its research. Also, some podcast distributors put ads on podcasts. Unless you hear me doing the ad, someone else is making money on that advertising. While all our podcasts, videos, and other information are freely given, they take resources to make. And if you're in a position to help support our work and be part of this community, please consider becoming a monthly supporter for as little as $3 a month through our Patreon page, patreon.com slash lowtechinstitute. Thanks to Chisei T and Todd F who signed up recently. If you'd like to sponsor an episode directly, please get in touch with us through our website, lowtechinstitute.org. As I said, I'm up on my roof of a, of a shed I built last year. This is a timber frame shed, and we'll talk more about timber frame throughout the next year. But basically, I'm up here, and I'm putting a whole bunch of straw on it to thatch it. There are many different ways that I could have roofed it, and I chose thatching. And thatching today has become a very expensive very upper class or high class or expensive roof. Uh, and the reason for that is, well, once upon a time, let's start a little bit with history. Once upon a time, thatching or vegetable matter was used as roofing since time immemorial. Since people have had buildings, people have been putting grasses, rushes, other things on top of it to keep moisture out. And it, it's been a very cheap, an easy primary roofing material for such a long time because it's abundant, it's cheap, it only takes labor, really. This would have been a byproduct of uh, agricultural production. So it really wouldn't have been a, a very expensive roof. Today, the only buildings that have thatch on them are, are pretty high-end, expensive buildings. Thatching is a very, very expensive proposition. The rule of thumb in the thatching community is that standard roof for a, a reasonably sized house costs the same as a car. So, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 to roof, probably more than that now. And what's happened to the thatching industry, and I want to get this out of, the, out of the way at the top because there's so many thatchers on social media, on the internet that have the most, they share just these beautiful, gorgeous thatching jobs they're doing, mostly in England, it's the ones that I follow. And it's just a different level of craft than it would have been practiced 150 years ago. 150 years ago, you could thatch a barn, you could thatch a shed, you could thatch your house. It wouldn't have been as restricted as it is today to these high-end houses or these historic homes where they're committed to spend the money to preserve that historic look of thatch. And so what's happened, I believe, is that thatch has fallen out of favor among more regular people and also among the skill set of regular people. My family builds houses. One of the only memories I have of my grandfather alive was being up on the roof of our garage that we were building. I was probably three years old and he was roofing. He was hitting a hammer into a nail and the nail went flying. I said, oh, I'll go get it, Grandpa. And he said, don't worry about it. That's like one of the few memories I have of him before he passed away. You know, a regular person can learn to do three-tap shingles pretty easy and that's kind of the point of the three-tap shingle is very easy. Thatching takes a bit more know-how, but it's not impossible. It's not an impossible task. I don't do it to a professional level. I would never do this on a dwelling I'm gonna live in, but for a compost hutch, it's perfectly fine. Nobody would ever put a thatch roof on a compost hutch nowadays because it would be too expensive. It's kind of unfortunate that it has become such a high-end roofing material because really it's so ecologically friendly, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that after I grab a different bundle here to this straw that I just put up here is too short for what I wanted to do. So I will be right back through the wonders of editing. This isn't gonna take a second for you. All right, that's better. <clears throat> the corners need longer straw to reach, reach the edges. So, thatching, roofing in general. Basically, 
Roofing, of course, is just trying to keep water and weather out of the house, the interior, right? Well, like I said, thatching or using vegetable matter on the roof has been around a long time. Nowadays, what predominates in the United States is asphalt shingles. Asphalt shingles are, ecologically speaking, absolutely terrible. They last forever and only a per tiny percentage of them are actually recycled, even though you could, in theory, send them to a shingle recycling center. Most shingles there don't actually get recycled. So, think about it this way. Those regular shingles you see on all these houses, every one you've ever seen in your entire life still exists somewhere on the earth. Isn't that kind of a trip to think about? Every single shingle that you've ever seen still exists somewhere on this planet. That's kind of sickening, really, if you think about it. The nice thing about thatch is when it's done, you just compost it. Same thing with uh, wooden shingles. Wooden shingles came about really with the advent of the circular saw or large circular saws, and they were able to replace or replicate slates, but with wood, which was significantly easier to work with and a lot cheaper. Thatching, and again, I, I shouldn't be teaching anyone anything about thatching, so I'm just gonna talk in real general terms. Thatching was around for such a long time, and then wooden shingles came on the scene, and then tar paper, although tar has been used since ancient Mesopotamia for roofing, tar is not a new roofing item at all, but in the US, it's mostly just these asphalt shingles that don't go anywhere. And I'm sorry for the slightly disorganized object of my talk today, but I'm up here on the roof. I don't have much time to get into the house and give a full regular uh, scripted podcast because I gotta get this roof on before the winter comes. So you're joining me. So what am I doing? Right now I'm affixing what's called the brow course. This is the bottom edge of the roof and it's gonna get the most water and rain on it. So it needs to be well affixed and affixed means under bar here, this sway. And what I'm doing right now is just taking armfuls of long straw. There are three primary types of thatch. One is called combed reed. There's long straw, first of all, is basically you get a pile of straw and you wet it and you pull out and create organized bundles called yelms, Y-E-L-M-S, and they are then used really to carry the straw up the roof and then the straw is affixed on the roof under bars that are called sways. And these sways used to be made out of wood, mine are made out of wood, because I have that available to me. But today, a lot of them are done with stainless steel and screws. I'm using wood bars, and I am using screws, although you could perfectly well tie all this down, which is a traditional way to do it. I have tied down this previous course because it's the very bottom brow course, and then this is getting affixed by a sway bar. So long straw is one of the more traditional, I suppose, because it's been around for quite a long time. It looks like the straw has been poured on it, like a kind of a more of a liquid state than a solid. It's really beautiful. It also takes a little bit more skill and specialized tools than what I'm doing, which is combed reed. Combed reed came about really at the time that mechanical threshers came about. And the reason for that is when you, the first mechanical threshers would bind sheaves of wheat and then chop the heads off or thresh the heads out and then leave these nice clean combed bundles. It was a me mechanized process that gave really nice uniform straw bundles to the thatcher. And then similar to long, and, and it's affixed similar to long straw, but it's a little easier, I think, to work with because it comes already in bundles. This is Maris Widgeon, which is kind of the gold standard of thatching straw. I grew this myself in the in the field next door. I have more growing right now. We have the wheat itself uh, to eat in our house. We make flour with it and bread. And so this is the leftover straw from my harvest this year, and I'm using it to thatch the roof. I grew it specifically for straw. I also have some rye, which also makes a good thatching straw. One second here, I have to use this legget, which is kind of like a, a big corrugated paddle, and I'm going to kind of start to shape the edge of this. If you want to see more videos of this, again, not for instructional purposes, only for educational purposes, just to kind of have a look at it, you can check out our Instagram, and we're there under Low Tech Institute, and you can see some, a couple of videos I made this week. So what I'm doing now is I'm driving the wheat up underneath the sway, which is the bar holding it all down, and that creates kind of a wedge, because it's fatter at the bottom, and so it creates a wedge that helps 
really pack this down. Straw in thatch is put down really dense. It's not that it is waterproof. If you thatched a flat surface and then put standing water on it, it would obviously leak through. What thatch is doing is that every single piece of straw in here is sloped downhill. And so by being sloped downhill, if, if a drop of water touches it, it runs downhill. And so the beauty or the, the functionality of a thatched roof is not in that it is waterproof, is that it is water shedding. And that's really important to understand. It's not waterproof, it's water shedding. And so what I'm doing, just like if you're installing shingles or any other piece by piece roof material, I am starting at the bottom and just working my way across and up to create an entire wall of water shedding material or a water shedding structure and shape. Now, aside from its ecologically friendliness of being easily grown and easily composted, someone might say, well, how long does, does a thatch roof last, right? So a typical asphalt shingle roof, you can expect about 20 years out of it. A wooden roof, a cedar roof, if installed properly, in theory, is supposed to last 30 years. And that's similar to a thatch roof. A, a properly installed thatch roof with no trees over it and a steep slope should last 30 years. However, the, the ridge that is the very top which gets a lot of weathering from the wind, might need to be redone every 10 years. So it needs a little bit of maintenance here and there, and it can be fixed and patched, and it can be revitalized in different ways, but it could last 30 years, which is a pretty good lifetime for a roof. I don't anticipate mine will last that long. I'm not installing it well enough. Again, I'm not a professional thatcher. I haven't learned this professionally, but that's also exactly my point. Somebody should be able to do this. People should be learning how to do this because this is a local material. I got this from, I can see the field just over there where all this straw came from. I can't say that about many building materials that we use today. And it's gonna be a problem as fossil fuels become less available to us. Where are we gonna get our roofing material? If we're completely dependent on asphalt roofs, where in the heck are we gonna get that when we can't use trucks to ship things long distances? A heavy asphalt, have you, if you've ever picked up a bundle of asphalt shingles, they're incredibly heavy. And not that straw isn't, but it's easier to handle and nicer, and it doesn't have to travel as far in theory if you're able to find someone who can grow it and harvest it. I realized I neglected to mention the third most common type of roofing material, and that's water reed, phragmites. They are invasive here in Wisconsin, and they are all over in other parts of the U.S., but these are water reed grasses that you'll see in ditches and marshes. They look like just a thin reed with kind of a flag, a sail type seed head on top. And these reeds are grow all across Europe and they're harvested in England and Turkey and all around the Mediterranean. And they've been used for thatch for millennia. And they're very common in England and also in the United States. There's a few thatchers in the United States, like three. We're all very friendly when I chatted with them through emails and in one case phone calls. Lovely people, but what I wanted was somebody to come teach a workshop for a weekend and every one of them told me it wasn't worth it because what you could learn in a weekend wasn't enough to start doing anything. And I, I believe that. I'm a very handy person and I also I'm not afraid to try things that I probably shouldn't be trying. But they said, in a weekend, you're not gonna learn enough. It would take a summer to become even halfway competent to like barely do anything. So there you go. That's why we're not having a workshop on this. Anyway, the reed, the water reed is what most US thatchers use. So if you've seen one of the few thatched buildings in the United States, it's very likely water reed. Water reed has a very dense, kind of thick, prickly appearance. It's got slightly larger straws, diameter than wheat. My wheat here is pretty narrow diameter, smaller than a pencil, whereas most water reed is gonna be pencil or thicker in terms of, of its diameter. But that brings me to an important point. I have permission from the Wisconsin DNR to harvest phragmites because they, as I said, are an invasive species here. So I have, a, I have to harvest them specially and treat them in a special way, but I'm allowed to harvest them here. DNR actually wants me to kill them off. So what a great synergy of things that we need. We need this reed to be gone and it works as a great roofing material. But those three materials, the long straw, the combed reed, combed wheat reed, 
and the water reed, just because those are the three most common doesn't mean that those are the only three you need to use. There's so many materials that can be used. Other types of straw, of course, uh, any hollow grass stem can be used. Down here, I've got weeds, canary grass, blue stem, and other grasses that work just fine for an undercoat. Um, and historically, people used whatever they had available for the undercoat. I'm installing what's called new work, right? There's nothing on the roof above me, and I'm installing fresh coat of thatch to a structure that has none. That's new work. Well, what's gonna happen over the next <laughs> 30 years, just kidding, it's not gonna last that long. <laughs> Uh, what's going to happen over the next years is that the tips of this straw is going to rot. But just the last inch or so, and hopefully I'll lose about an inch a year or less. And so the 20 inches or so between the fixing, the sway bar, and the tip of the straw, it's going to rot away. And by the time it starts to get close to that sway bar and exposes fittings below, it's time to put on a new coat. And that new coat can be put on top of the old work by just sparring it in the bottom undercoat. So the stuff that's above the sway bar will be on this roof, in theory, forever or until they decide to switch away from thatch. So what's really cool is that it's kind of a time capsule. By using this weedy stuff from some of the undercoat here in a thousand years or a hundred years, you could look and see what weeds were present right now. And indeed they've done that in England and they found thatch that's 500 years old and they could see what are the different plants that are common at that time. It's really neat, kind of a time capsule. So I'm installing, like I said, new work here. So some of this will rot away, but a lot of it will stick around for quite a while. So here it's not dense enough because I haven't tightened down the sway bar, but over here it's nice and dense. It, it's, it's, not a, it's not a loosely applied thing. So I said alternative materials, and I want to talk about that because when I lived in Mexico, uh, people used palm as a thatch, and it lasted 10 to 20 years depending on how, how uh, well it was applied and how thick it was. So the, the only things that the, the English thatchers like to use doesn't necessarily dictate what the rest of us have to use. It's just what the high-end houses in England can afford to have put on their houses, which is nicer stuff. And truly, combed wheat reed of Maris Widgeon is lovely to work with. I don't have much to compare it to, being a complete novice here. Although I have used Phragmites, and I don't like them as much. So it's, it's a lot coarser and just doesn't, but maybe that's just the Phragmites I was able to harvest. They weren't as good. So we could, in theory, be using weedy, unwanted vegetation for thatch locally. And this would be a huge help. And it would be really nice to get something like this going now, when we have the wherewithal to send people to England to learn how to thatch properly, rather than waiting 25 years till we don't really have access to fossil fuels. And then we have to scramble to figure out, well, how are we gonna put roofs on our houses? It takes a little bit of a design thought because a thatch roof needs to be steeper than a typical roof in the US. It should be at least 50 degrees. Even if you're doing a wood shingle roof, a 50 degree roof is preferable because the steeper the roof, the faster the water sheds off. In England, you can get by with a 45 degree roof with thatch, but we have more snow. And snow sits on the roof. And the whole point of thatch is to shed water, as I said. So if it's not shedding water, it's not doing its job. And by having snow sit on it, it's gonna make rot set in and you're gonna have a giant compost heap on top of your, your roof instead of a nice water shedding mat of material. It's a really beautiful process. I recommend a, a few resources online. One of them is called The Thatcher's Craft. It's a book from the 1960s or 70s, and it's a absolutely wonderful step-by-step -step guide with black and white pictures of every single step for the three primary thatch materials. Definitely worth checking out if you can find it. I found plenty of PDF versions of it online, so that's worth checking out, The Thatcher's Craft. And then there's another wonderful website called thatchinginfo.com and they have accumulated hundreds of photos, lots of step-by-step -step instructions, just wonderful resource overall, thatchinginfo.com. Uh, that one should be easily accessible to everybody, so that's definitely worth looking at. And those, as well as some videos online, will get you started. And then, if you dare, you can start following some thatchers on Instagram, and they post the absolutely most beautiful thatch that you've ever seen. But again, the, 
The issue is, these are all for high-end houses. Nobody does utilitarian houses anymore, so bringing back utilitarian thatch, I think would be a huge and useful step for a, a less carbon intensive future because it's not only beautiful and traditional, it's labor intensive and easier on ecological resources than everything else. I, I'd much rather see a whole bunch of people learning to thatch and use local materials to make beautiful roofs than continuing to cart in this asphalt crap that's gonna just sit in landfills forever. I'll try not to just rant and rave about asphalt roofs, but they're just an ecological disaster from creation to use to finishing. You shouldn't even be collecting rainwater off an asphalt roof because it drops, especially the first couple of years, there's a lot of shedding of, of chemicals and, and, and other things that were used to make it. It's, it. it's not great for putting on your plants that you're gonna eat, unfortunately. So again, I apologize for the rambling nature of this week's podcast, but it's a field recording. I'm in the middle of a project. It's gotta get done in time. That's how life goes sometimes, especially when you're doing a lot of random stuff like this yourself. It is nice to get out of the office, to be up doing something physical like this. Another thing I wanna mention is, this would fall well under what uh, I'm calling the 10 mile building rubric, which is a new idea. I've teased a few times on here and I'll introduce a little bit now. But basically the idea is that in a certain amount of time, an indeterminate amount of time, uh, we're gonna stop using fossil fuels whether we give them up or run out of them. And at that time, we're gonna undergo a huge change in how we live. And one of those changes is, how are we gonna build a house with materials that are on hand? And so I've come up with this thing called, I'm calling a 10 mile building rubric. Basically that means, can you build a building that comes, uh, of materials that come from within an average of 10 miles by weight? That basically means you add up all the weight of everything, multiply it out by how far it traveled, and then divide it all by the total weight, and you get the average miles traveled. There's more details on this on our website, lowtechinstitute.org slash TMBC. That's 10 Mile Building Challenge, TMBC, on our website. And next summer, excitingly, we are going to be, shush, sorry about the chickens in the background. We're excitingly going to be building a 10 mile building building and we're gonna follow that on our YouTube channel where you might be watching this now or if you want to see some of the thatching I'm doing go to youtube.com slash OC slash low tech Institute or just search for low tech Institute in the search bar or a low tech podcast and you can see this week's episode as, as a video which might be more interesting since I'm up here on the roof and so we're hoping to build an entire mini house with materials that are available close at hand so a 10 mile building challenge building so that that's originally why I got into thatching and again if, if, if you go with not go away with nothing else think about the the idea of utilitarian thatch as something that needs to be brought back and when you see these thatched houses realize you're looking at high-end beautiful you know, high, high, best level of craft that isn't necessarily indicative of what thatching was. Thatching was utilitarian, also high-end, but also utilitarian, and we've just lost that utilitarian portion of thatching. So I'm trying to bring that back with my terrible thatching job here. Uh, so we will post pictures of this as it comes to be finished or closer to finished on our Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. So check those out. Uh, if you wanna see this wheat being grown and harvested, you can check out the series I'm doing on our YouTube channel about growing and harvesting your own grains. So check that out also on our YouTube channel. Thanks for sticking around today. I'm gonna end it. It'll probably be a short kind of rambly one and I do apologize for that, but it is a field recording and I hope you guys will indulge me on these every once in a while. If you have ideas for the show or questions, feel free to write in. I'm Scott at lowtechinstitute.org and I'm always glad to hear from folks who are interested in learning more about any particular topic that might be related to what we're doing here at the Institute. That's it for this week. The Low Tech Podcast is put out by the Low Technology Institute. The show is hosted and co-produced by me, Scott Johnson, and co-produced and edited by Hina Suzuki. This episode was recorded in the Low Technology Institute gardens. Subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, YouTube, and elsewhere. We hope you enjoyed this free podcast. One way you can support the show is by leaving us a review. If you've done that, maybe you'd consider sharing our work with friends on social media. If you'd like to join the community and help support the work we do, please consider going to patreon.com slash lowtechinstitute and signing up. 
Thank you to our Forester and Land Steward level members, Sam Braun, Marilyn Skirpon, and the Hanvises for their support. The Low Technology Institute is a 501c3 research organization supported by members, grants, and underwriting. You can find out more information about the Low Technology Institute, membership, and underwriting at lowtechinstitute.org. Find us on social media and reach me directly at scott at lowtechinstitute.org. Our intro music was Last Slate of the Roof off the album The Mountains Don't Care About You by Dr. Turtle. That song is under the Creative Commons Attributions License, and this podcast is under the Creative Commons Attribution and Share Alike License, meaning you're free to use and share it as long as you give us credit. Thanks so much, and take care.